Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Cameron Byrne. I'm the General Manager of Partnerships and Memberships here at the AFA. I'm very excited to introduce you to today's webinar titled, Why Now is Time to Rethink Retirement? Brought to you in partnership with Challenger. During this session, the team at Challenger will discuss how the legislative environment and industry trends will impact advisors, the practical challenges facing retirement planning, advisor and client demand for innovation, and the range of strategies and tools available to support you in solving risks for retirement. Before we begin, I'd just like to cover off some webinar housekeeping. Today's webinar will provide one hour of CPD. We at the AFA will send details within the next week. As a webinar attendee, you will remain on mute throughout the session. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Please use the Zoom Q&A function and not the chat function. Today's webinar recording, slides, and the CPD assessment quiz for those that view this webinar online after the event will be available on our website. All registrants will receive an email confirming when it's available. If you've got any questions, please get in touch with the AFA. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to hand over to Rachel Fanto, New South Wales State Manager Challenger, to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Cameron, for the introduction to our session today. My name is Rachel Fanto. I know I look a little bit different to the picture you just saw on the screen, but I am subbing in for Liz today who is unwell. I'm really happy to do so, and, and I'm grateful always for the opportunity to work with the AFA and talk to everyone here today. For our session today, I will be moderating a question and answer forum all about retirement, and hopefully sparking some thinking around how we might look at retirement a little differently. I will now introduce our panel of experts. First of all, here we have today, uh, Aaron Minnie. Aaron is Head of Retirement Income Research at Challenger and has spent 10 years in research on investment and portfolio construction strategies that provide insights on how to deliver an appropriate income stream to retirees. Welcome, Aaron. Next, we have with us today, Melanie Dunn. Melanie is our Senior Manager for Retirement Solutions at Challenger. Melanie is a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries of Australia and is passionate about the de development of retirement solutions and tools to assist in providing retirees with financial security. With nearly 15 years experience in the sector, she has extensive knowledge and experience with self-managed super funds, superannuation and Australia's retirement system. At Challenger, she manages retirement portfolios that allow for decision-making in light of uncertainty and risk, assisting with product and solution research and design and the development of tools for financial advisors and retirees. So you might be asking yourself, why now is the time to rethink retirement? Well, the demand for retirement advice has never been so strong. With a retiree population growing by the day, combined with more complex client needs and expectations, is the retirement approach of the past still best practice for the challenges ahead? We at Challenger believe advisors are perfectly placed to help retirees manage their retirement savings protect against the risks of retirement and help them spend confidently throughout a lifetime in retirement. I have today a series of questions which I'll be asking the panelists in order to generate some discussion, but I'm also more than happy to take some questions from the audience, put these guys on the spot, and we can do that throughout the session or we can do it after the session, but I'll prompt you after the session uh, if you have any questions to ask us. If we do get a lot of questions coming through and yours is not answered over the course of the next hour, then we will certainly get in touch with you after and answer your question following the session. So let's talk about retirement space and delve into what we need to be rethinking to make sure retirement advice continues to be relevant and effective for the growing wave of clients. So now to my panelists, Aaron and Mel, in no particular order, where are you seeing the big changes in retirement at the moment? Yeah, look, I, I might jump in there, Rachel, and thanks everyone for coming along today. I think what we're seeing now is it's um, it's a bit like overnight success. You know, overnight success is normally something that takes 10, 20 years hard work before someone's sort of suddenly discovered. And I think what we're seeing now with retirement is the overnight success of the super system. In that, super's been around now for 30 years. Now, it's 30 years since the SGC took 10 years for that to get up to 9%, which was a decent chunk, you know, and we're on our way to 12. But what we've had now is that people have had long enough in, in the super system, saving enough money, 
that they're reaching the point of retirement where they've got a reasonable amount of savings. You know, adding to this, that there's actually a bunch of baby boomers that are still coming through the system. And this is what's creating a lot of opportunities and a lot of differences. If you go back 10, 15 years, you know, in terms of what people were retiring with, they'd sit there at retirement. You know, maybe they got the gold watch. You, know, you don't get a lot of gold watches these days because we change jobs too often. But they sit to the point of retirement and you used to go out where you'd sort of update the kitchen, you know, take a holiday, maybe get a new car. Maybe you'd sort of the grey nomad, you bought the caravan, trip around the country. But by the time you got home, they really didn't have a lot left. And this was the average person. You know, today, this average person, the average household retiring, have got a lot more money. You know, you're seeing sort of people retiring sort of out of average sort of jobs with three, four hundred thousand dollar balances, households with half a million. Yeah, you know, and this is somewhere where they're actually needing advice that is a bit more than just take a holiday and, and buy a new car. You know, unless they're buying some really expensive Italian sports cars, they're going to have money left over at the end of that. And so this is what creates an opportunity to get them sort of a solution. You know, and they, they really need help now because most of them don't have any idea what they're actually doing with it. Yeah, I think with, with more people in retirement, with more in savings, it's really become a bigger focus for government and industry. And we've seen this recently. Um, you all would have seen the retirement income review. And if you if you haven't read the very long document, I would recommend it. It's quite interesting. But, you know, some of the outcomes weren't particularly surprising for people like you and I. It really highlighted the complexity we have in Australia's retirement system. And, and an outcome of this is that at retirement, Many retirees, many people retiring with this significant balance, as Aaron identified, are finding it really hard to make a choice about what to do. And the end result is many are simply making no choice when it comes to retirement. More recently, we've seen the Retirement Income Covenant. This is a big change for APRA funds. And it comes into play from 1 July this year. And it's going to retire or require super funds to develop a retirement strategy for members. This retirement strategy is going to need to maximise retirement income over the period of retirement for members, whilst balancing the key retirement risks of inflation, longevity and market or sequencing risk with flexible access to savings. So that's one really big change. Another big change we've seen is the innovation around retirement products, particularly lifetime income streams. We saw the CIS regulation changes back in 1 July 2017, which permitted a whole range of new products, such as deferred lifetime annuities, market-linked lifetime annuities, and pooled longevity solutions. All of these pay an income for life, and they can offer a death benefit and withdrawal value in line with some particular restrictions called the capital access schedule. More recently, around 1 July 19, we saw some changes to the social security rules. Uh, for these new lifetime income streams that comply with the capital access schedule, only 60% of the investment in these new lifetime income streams is assessed under the assets test until age 84 or five years, and then only 30% is assessed. Under the income test, only 60% of payments are assessed. The outcome of this is it may lead to some retirees who invest in these products, particularly those retirees who may be part pensioners for the age pension to receive an uplift in their age pension entitlement. So with more people living longer and indeed healthier lives in retirement and with more money, it, it really isn't surprising to see some of these big changes happening and innovation around retirement strategies and products. Thank you for that. So with, with all those points that you've both just talked to, I'd now like to ask you both how you think these changes are creating opportunities for advisors. Yeah, thanks Rachel. Look, I think even just sort of the sheer number of those changes is probably the first thing. Like I, I sit here, I know most of this stuff. I'm just sitting back listening to Mel there for a second. My head's sort of spinning as she's going through all the things that's coming out. And I just think about it, you know, and I think about my parents or sort of, sort of retirees that I know. It's, they don't really have any, you know, it'd be lucky for them to understand sort of half or a quarter of what's actually happening and, and what's going on. And that's a shame for them because there's a lot of value in getting retirement right. And this is what's really creating then the opportunity for the advisors because, you know, when you're doing this day in, day out, you actually can understand what all these uh, you know, terms are, how you're managing through the retirement phase, sort of how you sort of deal with 
sort of jargon like longevity risk and it doesn't mean yeah just having money as long as you live and convert that out to the client and, and that's the real opportunity because is you know can converting the complex and sort of almost confusing nature of some of these things particularly once the politicians get involved and give us a covenant to something that your clients can understand and that then's a great opportunity and where it comes in here is with the, you know, Melvin, you know, we mentioned the sheer number of people. It's coming through and they've got these people here that, that they've really got money now to spend. You know, you've got a chance here to make these people actually feel great about themselves and feel really good. If you can sort of get the retirement right for them, you know, you'll literally have a new friend for life in the client side there because they'll be with you for life. And that's sort of what it's really all about is getting a better outcome for them. Um, and there's many more of them now with money um, that need the advice that you can provide. Yeah, I think I'll really echo that, that this idea that retirement is complex and it's, it's different to accumulation. There's a, a completely different mindset for both the, the retiree and yourself in how you think about and give advice for retirement. And, and even answering that question, like Aaron said, you know, how much, what lifestyle can I afford? What confidence can I have of spending? That's not a simple question to answer. It's actually really complex. And the Retirement Income Covenant gives us a really good clue to the types of things we need to think about in light of this complexity, you know, maximising income, managing risk, balancing flexible access to savings. In some ways, the Retirement Covenant may set a benchmark for how we think about retirement advice. One thing we do know is APRA funds are thinking seriously about this and they're developing strategies for cohorts of their members to provide and assess these risks and, and manage these outcomes. There are two opportunities, two key opportunities I see for advice out of the retirement covenant. The, the first is around how APRA funds are going to be implementing this. Now, we won't see it until 1 July 2022 this year, you know, the actual strategies um, that funds are going to publish and, and how, what they're going to think about here. But one thing we, we can uh, identify they're likely to do is increase their engagement to members about retirement. What are the risks? What solutions are they offering? Um, what products are available? Uh, in particular, the importance of this is that unlike my super in accumulation phase where uh, there is a default, uh, you can default a member into the retirement product or the accumulation product in that sense, the covenant is not a default. So we will not be defaulting members into a retirement solution. The need for the member to make an informed choice about what solution to enter in retirement is still there. So all those complexities uh, that we've identified exist within the system uh, are still there. And the member is going to be engaged with by the fund, be more informed about the risks and their choices and, and what to think about in retirement. And what we might see is more retirees be encouraged to seek advice, to help them navigate this new world of retirement solutions and, and indeed make a choice about the best option for them in retirement. So I really see an opportunity for advisors to help retirees navigate their choice within their APRA funds. A second key opportunity is around tailoring retirement solutions. So when we think about how the APRA funds are going to implement the covenant, it's going to be at a cohort level. If you think about what funds know about members, it's, it's quite limited. Uh, and our initial indications of how funds are tackling the covenant problem indicate they may be creating retirement solutions based on a few key known characteristics, maybe things like age, level of savings, age pension entitlements. Whereas as an advisor, you can sit down with the client and you can understand their personal circumstances, what their partner might have in super, what other income sources they have, what their goals and individual objectives for retirement are. In this way, I think the retirement covenant's a bit like building a house. The upper funds uh, are a bit like your kit home providers. So they know, uh, can ask a few key questions to members or know a few key characteristics about members that help them identify an appropriate solution. You know, in the context of building a house, you might know the block size and the number of people in the family. So if I've got three people in my family, I might be recommended a four bedroom house with a double garage and a small garden. And that might tick the box. That might suit me uh, based on my known characteristics. But in practice, we know everyone's different. You know, I might have a baby on the way or I might have my in-laws come to stay. Uh, I might need a really big garden. And that's where I could go to an architect. And an architect would design the house just for me. Everything I want, the fixtures and fittings, the actual design, the number of bedrooms, this is akin to financial advice. 
you're in a position to really tailor a retirement solution to their individual circumstances compared to the solution that might be appropriate for them based on their cohort characteristics. So that's the second key opportunity, I think, for advisors in light of the covenant is to really uh, promote your value in tailoring a retirement solution to your client's individual circumstances. Thank you. I love the analogy to uh, the houses there, Mel. I'm sure many listeners today will appreciate, including myself, the challenges associated with building and maintaining a house. Luckily for us, we don't have to solve for these today. But I will ask the panellists, however, uh, what would you say are the challenges in solving for these risks associated with retirement? Yeah, look, it, it's a great point there, Rachel, in terms of the challenges there, because often we see that the challenge and the opportunity are tied together. Um, you know, in some sense, there wouldn't be an opportunity if there wasn't a challenge. If it was easy and the retirees could all do it, well, you know, none of us would have a job. Uh, thankfully, that's actually not the case. But um, it, it's there is a need to sort of go out and have a nice, easy way of addressing those challenges to simplify it for the client. Yeah, and this is one good thing that actually has come out of the covenant. You know, Mel mentioned sort of the requirements of the trustees, um, and it gives a really good building block in terms of what you need to do. You know, for those sort of that have been following what we've talked about for a while, is you know, we used to talk about a, uh, a trilemma, you know, and certainly Mercer promote this as well, where you're thinking about these three pulling points. It's not quite a dilemma where it's sort of one versus the other. This trilemma, you had these three things in retirement where you're trying to maximize the return or maximize the income you've got you've got to manage the risks you know and make sure you know, the money lasts as long as the client and inflation doesn't eat it away uh, and then thirdly you've got to have something that's got ready access you know because if you've got it all tied up it, it doesn't help sort of the retiree plan around anything and as we all know things happen you know and if you've got a, a plan about what you're going to do every day doesn't quite work because something comes up, you need to you know, fix something in the kitchen or you know, update the car or, or something comes through. So you need something that's going to give you this flexible access and sort of in there. And it's not necessarily that any of them sort of work together. You know? And what you can do from the advisor point of view as an advisor is not to use the covenant directly sort of in terms of what APRA is requiring of the big super funds, but to understand what they're doing, because um, I think it's going to make it really easy to have that conversation with your client. And Mel was touching on this already. You know, one of the examples there is just think about what does what, what maximising income or drawdown mean? You know, if you think about a client, they've got their pot of money saved up. Really, your job as the advisor, when the client comes to you and they're at the point of retirement, hopefully they've been working with you for a few years, so they're in a good position. But your job from that point there is to make sure they get to spend as much of that money as they can while they can, you know, and that's not necessarily a, a straightforward problem. You, know, you can blow it all day one and then they're in misery for sort of 30 years or you can sort of scrimp and save and leave it all for the kids to go and sort of, you know, do whatever they want with it, which, you know, retirees I talk to are not quite in that mindset. You know, grandkids are okay, but the kids, no, don't want them to have the money. So it's this challenge of maximising these drawdowns, you know, and then you know, adding on to that, you've got to worry about what, what does inflation mean, you know? you know. We're seeing some scary numbers that have come out, you know, worst inflation in you know, whatever it is, 20 years now, that was post-GST. Um, you know, that, that, that's a bit of a, a sticker shock. Hopefully it won't be that bad. But one of the issues is even with modest inflation, you've got something you need to manage over time. And that's one of the challenges sort of, to get through there. And Mel, I think you're going to take us through good ways of doing that. Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned, the understanding how much you're spending um, and the impact deflation is, is really key uh, when it comes to retirement planning. Uh, so first we need to have a conversation with our clients, really understand their goals, their objectives. You know, some clients might be looking to, um, what's the thing, spend the kids' inheritance ski in their retirement. Others might be looking to leave a bequest um, to their family members when they pass away. But the first step is budgeting. We know that uh, in the accumulation phase, when we've got that salary coming in. Um, you, you'll know when clients come to your door to retire, if you ask them what they're spending their money on, many actually don't know. 
So we can start with the budget, understanding what we're spending uh, and in particular breaking that down between what are our essential expenditures, so things like our groceries, um, if we're a renter, our rent, our utility bills and, you know, what are those wants or those discretionary expenses that should times get really tough, maybe we can cut back on those. But really understanding what we're spending our money on it and whether it's really important to us. And everyone's going to be different here, you know. You might have Mr. Joe Smith, he might be a single retiree and, you know, that golf club membership might be essential to him. It's integral for his, uh, you know, being part of his community and enjoying his retirement, whereas someone else is going to have a different view on what expenses might be essential to them. So really understanding the essential and discretionary expenditures uh, and then recognising that that's just what that spending is worth today. Then we need to start thinking about inflation, you know, this idea that, I went down to the, the corner store when I was little and I could buy a lemonade icy pole for 50 cents. If I go back to that store today and buy a lemonade icy pole, it's probably going to cost me $1.50. Now, it's the same icy pole. In fact, it's probably smaller, but it's costing me more. And that's the impact of inflation. And it's really important that we recognise that in our retirement planning as it makes, you know, the affordability of our lifestyle much harder if we allow for that need to increase our spending or increase our income over time to allow for inflation. So the challenge is understanding the type of expenses we have, what's essential, what's discretionary, but also how we can maintain that lifestyle over retirement. And another part of thinking about inflation risk is then moving on to think about market or sequencing risk. So market risk, you know, managing investment risk isn't easy. Even professional fund managers experience years of low or negative returns and in retirement, unfortunately, this can mean you can be exposed to sequencing risk. It's a subset of market risk and basically boils down to the risk that the order and timing of the returns you actually receive are unfavourable. And it happens in retirement when two conditions are met. First, where you have volatility around the returns being received. And secondly, where you have cash flows. That is, you're drawing down on your savings to fund your retirement. The problem is that the actual sequence of returns we achieve in retirement can lead to very different outcomes. But we haven't got a crystal ball. We don't know what returns we're actually going to receive. All we really know is they're going to change year to year. And the challenge is that you can have two sequences of returns that maybe even have the same average return and you get very different outcomes based on when the good and poor returns are received. So given we don't know the future returns that are going to happen, solving those key retirement questions like how much can I afford to spend allowing for it to increase annually with inflation is really challenging in light of sequencing risk. But as an advisor, there are some things you can think about because the objective, the goal of your client of how they construct their drawdowns in retirement impacts their exposure to sequencing risk. And Aaron, I know we've actually done some, some quite comprehensive thinking about this, of how we can help advisors categorise or assess the risk faced by their clients. Exactly, Mel. And that's sort of, there's a, a big piece we did a few years ago looking at um, the different approaches to retirement uh, in terms of uh, really, what, what, I suppose, when you're looking at the client in terms of where they're going through retirement, you know, you, you might run into some of them. They might have the surname like you know, Murdoch or Packer or something. And they've got so much money, they don't know what to do with it. Um, you know, no matter what they spend, it just keeps growing. Uh, you wish you had at least a dozen of them, but you're probably lucky to see one. You know, and they're just going to keep growing their wealth through retirement, no matter how much they're spending. Um, and good luck if you can get them. But there are another couple of clients there where um, sort of can be quite a difference. I think in the more traditional retiree clients you'd be used to seeing, you know, and this is before the average person had a lot of money, those who made it to retirement made it there with a fair amount of money um, and they were able to sort of live off the income and it was pretty good. Um, they, they weren't going to sort of churn through it all and they'd be preserving most or sort of all of their capital. And I think that's the ones where the sequencing has really sort of became um, a, a much, a, people were much more aware of that issue because when you're trying to preserve the capital, this is where the market swings. You, you get the downturn at the wrong time um, and you, you face a real challenge to uh, get back up. You know, we all know the market goes down 10, but it's got to go up 11, you know, down 20, up 25. So if you're going down 10 and you're taking money out, 
well, it's no longer up 11, it's sort of going to go up 12, 13. And it's that slippery slope that makes sequencing such a sort of insidious problem in retirement. And, you know, there's a whole lot of, you know, strategies, you know, you do some income buckets or sort of try and preserve that cash flow there. So simple ways of doing that. And then the challenge, of course, is to make it simple for the client to understand what you're doing so that they stick to their guns. You know, uh, we're used to it in the accumulation phase where sort of people want to stay in the market, you know, clients who hung in there sort of, you know, two years ago when the um, pandemic hit and markets plummeted and didn't bail, they benefited from recovery, same as those who did the same through the GFC. And it's when those clients actually listen to the advice and follow it through that you get that impact. And I think sort of keeping it simple and keeping it there is a great way to, to help those clients through. And I think the, the, the next category of retirees is around thinking about those retirees who are actually spending down their savings and the challenges, you know, that brings are quite different, isn't it, Aaron? Exactly. And it's interesting, I just see someone's throwing in a question here about explaining this to clients sort of, you know, because if you're spending down your, your savings, you know, and it depends on how much you've got, right? If you've got a huge amount of money, you don't need to spend it down. But if you've got a substantial sum, but not a very large sum, then you probably want to enjoy that and spend it on yourself. Now, the challenge, of course, is to spend it so that you don't run out. You know, if you spend too much and run out, well, you've got five, 10, maybe 15 years of sort of having to survive on the age pension. You know, your clients aren't going to think you've done a great job for them there if that's the end solution. You know, ideally, they talk about the last check bouncing, you know, having the kids pay for their funeral, you know, which is one way of thinking about it. But in, in jargon, that's what we call longevity risk. Yeah, and sort of having the money last. And that's sort of what people uh, think of as just money for life. You know? And you know, this question here about how you sort of explain the benefits to the client is I like this idea of simplicity. You know, we do research with national seniors uh, and you know, there's, there's two top concerns that always come up. One of them is health and how do I pay for health? And the other one is how do I make sure my money doesn't run out? You know, and the solution that a lot of people do is they just stop spending. Yeah, you know, it's great. If you spend nothing, it doesn't run out. But it's not a great retirement then. So you sort of work hard for 40 years, put the savings away and don't spend it. There's no payoff in that side there. So you get something that has a nice solution. You know, this is what the product solution is. The role then of the advisors will sit there and go, understand your client and say, well, look, you know, Here's a simple thing. We can give you a little bit of money that won't run out. You know, you know you've got the age pension. That's not enough. How do we top that up just a little bit? Uh, and when it's only a part of it, it's something simple, ties back into their um, real, real fears and removing their fears is a great way to win sort of you know, goodwill from your clients. I think that's a nice, simple way of explaining the concept to them. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Aaron. I think... You know, sitting down with clients and, and talking about life lifespans or passing away, it can, it can be really challenging. And, and you know, it's so important to have those estate planning conversations um, and to have those retirement income conversations because, you know, the last thing we want is to get 20 years down the track and um, not have our estate planning in place and, and not have the wishes of the retiree, you know, you know, met as they get towards the end of their life. But we also want to make sure they have that confidence while they are alive to enjoy their retirement and, you know, have a retirement income that means they can meet, you know, those essential expenses we talked about. So having those conversations early and helping your retirees, you know, understand the jargon, as, as Aaron mentioned, you know, we can talk about average lifespans and how long someone's going to live. But when it comes to, re to retirement for an individual, some of those metrics actually aren't that useful. Only a very, very small proportion of, you know, all males age 67 in Australia are going to live exactly to their life expectancy. There's a huge range of outcomes that they could actually survive to. And so it really boils down to that confidence, that the fact that we are facing a, a significant uncertainty here about how long we're going to live. We are living longer. You know, the statistics are showing that, that, you know, thinking about when your grandma died or your great grandma isn't necessarily the best benchmark for how long you're going to live. Um, and, and there's a, a, you know, a real chance that you might live longer than, it, than the average. So understanding that there are long time frames in retirement and that, it, you know, we need to have this lifestyle, this income we want to enjoy for our lifetime, 
how can you deliver that confidence that their income is going to last as long as your clients do? And I, I think, you know, that's a really important part of the conversation, helping them understand uh, retirement's a long time, retirement's different, and, and that there is this uncertainty that you can help them manage uh, by, you know, providing them confidence of receiving an income for life. And, you know, we, we've covered off on all these risks, the, you know, managing inflation and market and longevity risk in developing our retirement solutions. But, but one of the things Aaron mentioned at the start was this idea of flexible access to savings. Uh, and it's kind of our final challenge in, in completing a retirement strategy for a retiree. But what does it mean? And, and I think Aaron, you know, touched on some really good points in his explanation there that it's, it's not the, you know, your annual spending that you're, you've budgeted for, but it's those unexpected or emergency events that you might um, not expect in retirement that you, you want to have that money there to pay. It might also be things like paying off debts. So when someone comes to you looking to retire, you might want to think about uh, if they're planning to pay off their mortgage, for example, thinking about what retirement savings are left after that and then what the retirement strategy appropriate to that level of savings would be. But yeah, it comes back to budgeting. And I think budgeting is a really great way to approach this problem of helping your retiree understand what flexible access to savings means to them. So we've talked about thinking around there, what's their essential expenditure, what's their discretionary expenditure they might expect in retirement. But are there other lump sums or one-off expenses they are planning for? Maybe, as Aaron mentioned, they want to buy a new car, go on a holiday, pay for their children's wedding. This can be a much more informative approach to thinking about flexible access to savings than asking a question like, do you want to have access to your savings? Because inevitably the answer to that is going to be, yes, I want access to all of it. Uh, but we want to really think about what that means and what goals we're trying to achieve. And, and this is where it comes back to that challenge around the trade-offs. You, unfortunately, you can't achieve all of these objectives all the time. We can't maximise income and mitigate risk and have flexible access to our savings all in one pie. So helping you and your retirees understand the trade-offs and make some decisions around the prioritisation of those trade-offs, you know, is really important. And Aaron, I think, you know, this is something you are always talking about, that this trade-off around the different objectives. Yeah, that's right. And look, there's a great example, Mel, when you're talking about flexibility. Um, when the UK, you know, when rates got really low and they decided to uh, stop compulsory 100% annuitisation, everyone balances back in, I think it's about 2013, 2014, the pensions minister at the time said, you know, they called it freedom and choice. And he came out and said, you know, if, if, my, if the retiree wants to go out and buy I think I can't remember what it was a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. It was an, an Italian sports car. If they want the, to go out and do that, well, jolly well, they can. You know, but the problem is, of course, if you go out and spend all your money on a Ferrari at the start of retirement, what are you eating when you're 75? Well, you know, you can't sort of take a wheel off the tire, a car and eat that. It'd certainly make the car not very helpful for anything. So I think this is the challenge in terms of this flexibility and, um, you know, the trade-off that's there. You can have it more now, but you can't always have, you've got to have it more later as well as the option there. So this is this challenge that comes through on that side. Well, thank you guys. Mel, you know how to paint a picture. Honestly, it took me right back to my childhood with the icy pole. It's a little bit cold in Sydney at the moment to be thinking about that. But uh, guys, before we move on to the next section, we have had another question come through. Um, would you, we, we, we're okay for time. Would you like to address this one now or, or hold for yeah. to the end? Yep. Um, we've had someone ask, I saw the idea of using a risk-free retirement income stream, example, inflation-linked life annuity, as a reference point in a discussion with a retiree. How do you think this could be introduced into a conversation with a retiree as a way to understand potential risk-reward trade-offs? Yeah, look, yeah, first of all, thanks for the plug. Uh, I didn't think we were doing a sales plug, but it was put that in there. Great. But on a more serious note, like I saw this, this is... Um, a paper recently by uh, Andrew Bowl from uh, Deloitte, so I almost said Rice Warner, but they've moved now, looking at that as the base case. And it's not a new idea. You know, uh, Robert Merton, sort of the US academic, sort of Nobel Prize winner, talks about this as well in terms of what actually is risk-free in retirement. And it's the difference, you know, when you look at your, your standard investments and you think about the risk-free asset, you know, you go back to, you know, finance while investing 101, People always think about cash and you know, most people understand what cash is. The money's at the bank. 
you want to go get it tomorrow, it's there. It's the same amount. Maybe you've got a bit of interest. Yeah, not lately. Maybe in the future we will. But it was that asset that didn't change. When you get to retirement, what you want isn't that the money's going to be there. To, what's there today is there tomorrow. What you want is a stream of income so you can buy the basically the goods and services you need over a long period of time. So this is why they sort of sit there and go, well, here's an income stream. Let's put an inflation adjustment on, on it. And that's really what, what the base case is. So it sort of makes a lot of sense that that's the most secure sort of investment you've got. Prices of those do move around because markets, you know, there's a lot of time factors in that there. So there's a lot of sense in terms of what it is. The question is really about how do we introduce it into a conversation with the retiree and understand those risk-reward trade-offs? Well, I think to me, let, let's just get back to the nature. You know, when they're retired, they are not working, no other income, they're going to have to want to spend money over time. So if you think about well, how are you going to spend money next week, five years' time, 10 years' time, 20 years' time, and how do you know what you're actually going to get? And so you can sort of get this idea that this is what they actually need yeah, uh, and then you can highlight. Well, there's there's two ways of doing this, you know, and simplifying it quite well. One is we can go lock that up, and we'll get you this here, and I could give you pick the dollar amount. Yeah, here's a million dollars. I can give you fifty thousand a year the rest of your life. You know, adjusted for inflation, no worries. Now that, that that's great, but it probably won't do what they need. What they want is something that's actually going to have a bit of market exposure as well. Now you could, we could do this in the share market. And we do it in here where we might expect sort of that we can take 60,000 now. Yeah, you know, of course, if things don't go well, that may be 40,000 in three years' time, but that's the, the risk you've got to take that you might get sort of a higher amount overall. So the same way that you do sort of a, a growth investment sort of versus a cash or fixed income for the accumulator, you can translate that to an income, which is what matters in retirement, what they need to actually have in terms of what's, what's risk-free and how might they get some more, but with the risk that they don't? And then it's a question of sort of sorting out sort of with you and the client, you know, you've got your risk tolerance questionnaires and profiling, all that sort of thing. How much do they want um, secured? And how much do they want to have where they can spend it sort of, you know, if it doesn't quite happen one year, they can leave it, but they can get more in another year. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Mel, in the interest of time, did you have any quick comments before we move on to the next section? No, I think that's fine. If we're if we the time, we can keep going. That's, that's fine with me. Perfect. Well, now we are moving to the topic of rethinking. Uh, but before we dive into the questions for the panellists, I would like everyone online to turn your mind to your own business and perhaps think of a couple of questions to get us into the rethinking mode. Questions such as, is your business considered a specialist in retirement? Or do you have a retirement specialist within your business? If yes, what is it about your business that differentiates you in this space? And if no, is this a specialised area that you wish to expand into? I also want to ask the audience, what does retirement mean to you and what does it really mean to your clients? But now for the panellists, in your opinion, what should advisors be thinking about if they're looking to give their clients greater confidence to spend in retirement? Look, I think advisors are in a, a great position to give clients confidence. I mean, that's the whole point of financial advice, right? To understand someone's goals and help them achieve those objectives. I think I think two things are really important, and, and we've discussed this at length already. You know, first is what matters to your client? What are their goals, their objectives that you're looking to help achieve? Remembering that this is a you know a change in their life, a significant change, helping them work through these these um, the risks and the, the challenges to, to really come up with some goals and some objectives for their retirement. So we can start to think about answering those types of questions like what's affordable, what can I afford to spend? And the second part of it is understanding that retirement is different. There's different challenges to overcome to accumulation phase and how we achieve those objectives of our client while managing those complex risks and trade-offs uh, in light of future uncertainty means we have different ways and strategies we need to solve these complex problems. So for me, it's about equipping yourself and your business with the right tools and strategies. You know, think about what tools do you have available to assist you in comparing and assessing different retirement strategies. Do your tools arrive for risk? 
do they allow you to model a range of income, um, you know, market returns and inflation outcomes, something that as an actuary I'd call stochastic modelling? Um, do your models allow for the age pension and, and the means testing? You know, it's really important that the tools and models we use to help give our advice, compare scenarios and make decisions um, are reflective of the complexity of Australia's retirement system. Another thing to think about is, do, does your licensee offer you blueprints or strategy documents, model portfolios to help you with your retirement strategies? You know, a starting point for your retirement advice for the different types of clients you might encounter. It can be really you know, valuable in your business to have a retirement philosophy. Um, you know, Aaron touched on before this idea of how we can use a, an inflation-linked lifetime annuity. I was actually working with a licensee recently on a, on a framework that takes that approach and creates a retirement philosophy around it. So this idea of, you know, how can we help clients who have an objective to have confidence about spending their essential income for life. What are the steps that I as an advisor need to take to deliver a retirement strategy that achieves that objective for the client? And we work through to develop a framework that helps the, um, the licensee have a, a framework for how they can implement that retirement strategy for that type of client. So I think, you know, you can be sure that APRA funds are comprehensively thinking about all of these retirement complexities. Uh, but there's no reason why you as advisors and your licensees can't access similarly sophisticated thinking to deliver really good retirement advice. Yeah, thanks, Mel. And I think one thing I'd add to that as well is in addition to this, you know, having that sophisticated thinking and analysing and knowing sort of the solutions working for the client, it's getting that simple message back across to the client. You know, if you think about, you know, I was talking before about getting the clients to stay the course through the market downturns, you know, and you've all got clients that you've managed to do that with. Well, what are you actually doing there? You know, you're overcoming their biggest fear. You know, their biggest fear when the market's falling is that it's going to collapse away forever and they're going to lose everything, you know, and they'll come in and panic and stuff in there. And when you can sit down and go, well, actually, you know, we've, we've talked about this, markets go up and they go down, and this is the down and we've got to hold in there and it'll go back up and you do and it comes back up and you sort of, sort of comfort those fears. When you look at sort of retirees, you know, as I said before, their two biggest fears were health and running out of money. You know, and the work that we've done with National Seniors and I've seen other, other firms have gone out and studied this as well. They do the same thing and surprise, surprise, they end up with the same results because we're both just talking to retirees and it's here in Australia and overseas as well. This fear of running out of money is very real. You know, and so what you need to do is to find something that gives them the confidence to spend. So if you can show them that actually, well, either you won't run out of money, great, you have never run out of money, or probably more importantly, is you don't, you won't run out of the money you need. You know, so in terms of thinking about, well, what, what is it you absolutely need? You know, and for some people, you know, maybe they don't have a huge amount of um, sort of, you know, it's a very relatively frugal living. That could just be an age pension. You know, if I look at the age pension, says, well, you know what? Yeah, you know, my mother used to live on that. I could live on that if I had to, and I'd be happy. Well, problem solved. Then they can go and do what they like with the money now and sort of spend it all because the age pension will cover them later on. That's going to give them, you know, once they know that the worst case is something that they're happy with, then they'll have the confidence to spend. Now, in most cases, people coming to see you, are, they've probably got a little bit more money than the average retiree, and they're probably going, well, yeah, I'm going to need a little bit more than just the age pension. So if you can find a solution, and whether it be one of the ones that you know, Rachel and her team can talk to you about or other sort of product providers out there, having a solution for your client so you can sit there and go to them, you know what, if things go wrong, you'll always have this. Yeah, and you don't need to worry about running out. You don't need to worry about the, the cost of your medicines later in life. You'll have this money to cover it. Then they can take a, a big breath now and go, great. You know what? I might go see the grandkids over in the UK. I've not been there for a while. Or I might do this and do that. And they can then go out and enjoy sort of the retirement while they can. You know, and there used to be a thing, um, a sort of study in the US that looked at, this goes back a few years now, that was this wave of charity that was coming out of all these 90-year-old widows. Um, and it was basically they discovered that these women who'd been frugal for so long got to about age 90 and realised they couldn't spend their money. 
Um, and in some cases, it was literally a case of, well, I don't want to give it to him, you know, hate the daughter-in-law and don't want her to get any of the money. So they didn't start giving it away in large tranches. But it was happening in their 90s because it was too late for them to do something with. So the idea of giving them the confidence to spend now is that they can enjoy it themselves. You know, charities might miss out a little bit later on, but that's okay because your role is to sort of help the client and, and get what they want and need through retirement. Thank you, guys. I, I have one more question for you, but we have had a, a question come through the chat. So I might address that one now because I think it's one that you'll you're both, you're both like. Uh, so we have uh, someone say that I like a bucketing approach because I like how easy it is to explain to clients and they tend to make uh, better behavioural decisions. Any idea on how an, any annuity could fit into a bucketing approach? I think for me, um, you know, it can, it can be as simple as, as your traditional bucket approach, you know, so you've uh, traditionally, we might think of our, our growth, our income, and our spending buckets. Um, now, in that income bucket, we can we can talk about the lifetime annuity fitting within that capacity. So, you know, back to Aaron's point around confidence. If we have a bucket uh, that we've put some savings in that will provide us, you know, that income for life to to tick off all of those fears and uncertainties that someone has it really helps you um, go ahead with your kind of standard bucketing approach on the rest of the balance to, to really maximise that growth and that potential return on, on the remaining savings over time. Aaron, I'm not sure if you've got anything to add to that. Oh, look, there's, I think that's probably the best way of doing it. Like if you wanted to do something a little bit tricky, you could create a fourth bucket with, you know, there's a product out there which is the deferred annuity. So just in case the other ones run out, um, there's something you can do on that side there. This, to me, the bucket's a really simple approach because it sort of sits there and it says, you know what, for the next year, next two years, next three years, you don't need to worry. You know, and when you've got a client coming back in two or three years' time and you'll have the same problem, I think that's going to be great. Um, you know, the annuity you described there, Mel, well, actually what we do, we just do a little bit of an uplift. So instead of covering everything for a couple of years, we can cover a little bit for all the years. And so you can fit it in in that mindset concept there and have it really easy to explain to the client as well. Yeah, I really like that, guys. So get a bucket of stuff that you absolutely need and, and you want confidence and comfort that that income's not going to run out or, or stop. But for one more question from me, uh, again, in, in your opinion, where do you see more changes to come for retirement advice? And against this backdrop, how are advisors solving for retirement? Yeah, look, for me, Rachel, just very quickly on that. I, I think it probably sounds a little bit cliched, but it, it's a bit more of the same in the sense that um, there's a lot of stuff happening now. And I don't know that there'd be, you know, you know, there might be a few on the call here that are, but probably not. I don't know that there's that many advisors that are on top of all the changes that have happened in the last couple of years. Now, Mel mentioned the, the in innovative product design. You know, there's been a range of products. We've, you know, stuff we've brought to market, there's other super funds and other providers out there talking about new innovative ideas that will help their clients through retirement. And, you know, as an advisor, you, know, you really need to sit down and understand what they all do and uh, what are the benefits that each of these are providing to the clients? Because, the, you know, you go back to the tools you had, you know, five years ago, you know, was a relatively limited set, you know, and you were able to do some things with that. But now you've got a bigger range of tools. So the, the challenge here for the advisors and the, the change is actually understanding these tools and figuring out how to actually use them. You know, if we think about, you know, we always talk about productivity and, you know, use the, the iPhone as an example. You know, when the iPhone 1 first came out, um, you know, it was nothing like what we have in the phones today. You know, the, the concept of the app, you know, which was just a simple web page, really, that sort of what you were tied to is so vastly different to what we've actually got today. So it takes time for the innovation to be put into place. And I think we're going to see more innovation, but it's when the advisors put the innovation into place and find better ways of dealing with their clients that we really get the best, best outcomes there. And I think being a part of that is going to get great opportunity for advisors and sort of get better results for your clients. And I think that's sort of going to be a great bit to be in. Yeah, I, I just echo what Aaron said. I think you know, our challenge or your challenge is taking that theory of solving for retirement, all of the risks we've, we've talked about today, all of these new products that you have available, and putting it into practice. 
how can we take what we know we need to think about and, and all of these innovative products and actually be an efficient way to implement strategies for clients? And you know what, I'm seeing advisors and licensees take steps to proactively address this problem of solving for retirement. Um, I mentioned before that, you know, we're seeing uh, dealer groups and licensees develop frameworks, you know, internal views about retirement strategies and philosophies, uh, training teams on how to approach retirement, how to address the risks. Um, you know, another recent licensee framework we're developing um, is looking at how you can fit within a retiree's risk profile. This this concept of lifetime income while keeping a simple risk profile across the lifetime income and the you know, account-based pension uh, and developing a framework that helps the licensee or the, the advisor implement that market-linked lifetime annuity to deliver the confidence of income for life, but still stay invested in the market across all of the investments with the retiree. So there's some really innovative stuff happening. And, um, you know, as Aaron mentioned, it's a matter of you know, getting your teeth into really understanding all of the different opportunities that you have available and then condensing that back into some, you know, retirement strategies for you and your firm that can really help you as a starting point each time you get that client in front of you who's looking at retirement, you know, having a real solid confidence and understanding in how you can deliver a retirement strategy that will achieve the, you know, objectives and goals. I think also, as I mentioned, um, you know, a passion of mine is, is how we model retirement and the tools we use to help us compare strategies and give our financial advice. And, you know, I'm seeing so much development in this space as well. Go back, you know, 10 years and traditional models of retirement just use fixed assumptions, maybe just look at account-based pensions and some simple non-super assets. But but today, that they're so much more sophisticated. You know, you have real power at your fingertips to, to analyse the range of outcomes in retirement, compare different types of retirement strategies and really have an evidence-based approach um, in how you deliver your advice. So I think it's, it's really great to see advisors be proactive in retirement and look to improve their own efficiencies and how they deliver advice in a, in a best practice way to, to meet all these challenges we've talked about today. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you, Aaron. We've, we've come to the end of my questions, but we do have a few minutes spared and five minutes spared to um, take some questions from, from the audience. And we have one that's just come through. Uh, do you have a view on the use of home equity as an additional form of retirement income, whether to top up or uh, top up super or just to complement your super and or pension? Yeah, look, I'll take the first step of that one, if you like, Mel. Um, thanks, Esther. I think, you know, there's one thing, just as I read your question there, it's sort of retirement income. Uh, and I think it's important to keep that as different. I think there's a real role for uh, retirees being able to use equity in the home to sort of supplement their savings. Yeah, because the equity in the home, it, it is a balance. You know, retirement is about converting sort of this balance into income. So it, there's a question then of, okay, if you if you need extra income, how do you convert the capital in your home to generate that higher income? And I think there's sort of a scope out there and there's, you know, obviously there's different style, whether it be a reverse mortgage or a home equity release, there's scope that can actually get out and do that. The, the challenge at the moment in the Australian context is just all the rules around sort of how that works and how that interacts. Um, and again, this is not personal financial advice. So whatever the disclaimer is, needs to be there. At the moment, I'm sure you all understand that. But when you're looking at sort of the, the value of the home um, and the treatment for settling, as soon as you sort of draw against it, you've then got an asset that counts against your settling sort of for the age pension. So it sort of kind of doesn't work if you're in that part pension zone. Um, and there's the whole timing there. You know, if you look at what a retirees actually say, probably twice as many want to hang on to the home than want to hang on to any value in their own savings. So I think it's a, a secondary effect, but I think there's plenty, plenty of options out there for those who find they don't quite have enough, you know, and you'll have many, I think you'll have many clients that are probably, you know, in their seventies and older, that super wasn't there early enough for them, you know, but they had the home because they could buy it back before house prices went completely stupid. You know, I'll, I'll keep it there to keep the language polite because it's probably a description of house prices. So there's an opportunity for them to sort of free that up one way or the other. Yeah, I think I, I just, um, you know, echo what we were talking about before in terms of, 
you know, it is another option. So making sure as an advisor, you understand the different schemes that are available. Another one is, of course, the government's pension loan scheme, um, but also to understand the risks and trade-offs around utilising those schemes in retirement and, you know, what it means for estate planning, uh, what it means for, uh, you know, should you need to downsize or do different things in the future. So really just about making sure you, you do understand the problems um, or do understand the products and how they work and would integrate within the retirement strategy. Thank you. Look, I think that brings us to a close for our why now is the time to rethink retirement panel discussion today. I would like to extend a huge thank you to you, Mel, and to you, Aaron, for doing all the hard work and answering our questions. But most of all, I would like to thank the AFA for this opportunity to present and, and to everyone, everyone online for your attention and participation for the last hour. You really allowed us to step you into the retirement zone. And, and if uh, by being in that zone, other questions pop up in your mind, then please, by, by all means, reach out to any of us. We'd be more than happy to chat. Um, at Challenger, we have a range of support services for you and your business, including advisor and client resources, support materials, as well as tools, calculators, and advisor education. If we work with you and your business already, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the entire Challenger distribution team for your support. But if you're new to Challenger, then I welcome you, and I, I really do look forward to working with you in the future. There was mention today about product innovation. I know, Mel, you touched on it towards the end there. But if you haven't already seen, we do have a recently launched new product, our market-linked lifetime annuity offering. So if you have any further questions or if you'd like to know more, then please don't hesitate to contact one of the team. We're all more than happy to assist at any time. I believe a contact sheet has been included somewhere in this webinar. Otherwise, you can find that on our website where we're all there listed, ready to go. So again, I thank you. I hope everyone has a really successful day and I've really enjoyed this time with you. So thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank everyone. you. On behalf of the AFA, thanks, Aaron, Melanie and Rachel for your input today. It's been a very valuable session and I'm sure our members um, have and will get a lot out of it. So I think it's a really uh, you know, prudent subject to cover off at the moment. And I think we're now all waiting for 2.30 for the RBA announcement to see, you know, mention inflation and impacts during the, the course of the uh, the panel conversation. So that will be the next uh, challenge we, we face into. So on behalf of the AFA and our members, uh, we'd like to thank you very much, Challenger, for your participation in this webinar today. Thanks very much.